fish living in Devonian ecosystems. What does that mean? That means every time you bend your wrist and every time you shake your head, you can thank these fish adapting to Devonian ecosystems 375 million years ago. And how do we know this? We know this by people going around the world discovering fossils. We know it by looking at embryos and comparing embryos to different creatures, which I'll show you in a second. And we know it by comparing DNA. It's a, it's, it's a story of so many different lines of evidence. When you do this exercise, it changes the way you see humanity, the way you see the world. You're looking at this gentleman, right, and you see Albert Einstein. You see a pinnacle of human achievement. Yeah, I look at this, and I see a big, fat, old, bipedal fish. <laughs> and in a second, let's compare Einstein to the fish, OK? Um, I labeled it. Einstein is on your, uh, on your left. Um, but let's just look at development. Let's compare. Um, let's look at an embryo. Let's look at Einstein's head a few weeks after conception, right? What do you got? What you have in the embryo is you see paired eyes. You see paired primordia for the eyes right here. And then you see these swellings in the pharyngeal area. And I've color coded them, light blue, dark blue, green, and yellow. And you can see there's swellings inside, and there's little clefts between them. There's a furrow even on the inside. There are cells inside this, and they're doing all kinds of amazing stuff. Guess where else you see these? You see them in fish and sharks. Now, the embryos aren't identical, but what you see is paired primordia for the eyes. And you see these swellings with slits between them and folds of tissue and so forth. What can we do? Well, we can trace. We can label these cells in these. We can label them with dyes. And we can follow them during development. And we can ask, where do they end up? Well, if you do that, what you find in a shark, at least in fish, is that first one, right, light blue, becomes portions of the upper and lower jaw. And then the other ones become portions of the gill apparatus. OK? And that includes the bones, the muscles, the nerves, the arteries, all the machinery in those things. What happens in humans, other mammals, and so forth? Well, look at it here. Um, you have in the first one becomes a bone in the lower jaw, and then two bones in the middle ear. The, the next one becomes a bone in the throat called the hyoid bone, as well as one bone in the, in the middle ear called the stapes. And the others become portions of the hyoid and voice box, as well as the muscles and nerves and bones that control all that stuff. What does it mean? What this means is that with the muscles and nerves and bones I'm using to talk to you with right now, and many of the muscles and nerves and bones that you're using to hear me with right now correspond to gill structures in sharks and fish. And how do we know that? We know that through these developmental comparisons, but we also know it from the paleontology. I could show you an evolutionary series of fish, amphibians, and tetrapods, limbed animals, that show this bone, a gill bone, reducing in size until becoming the stapes in the middle ear. Remarkable. Nothing you would predict without looking at the data. And we see this again and again in fossils and DNA and in embryos, this, this, these, these kinds of links. And you know, the story gets, and when we think about exploration in science, it's not just field work, but it's also understanding the lab. I mean, when you think about the, how the human body has its roots in a single cell, a fertilized egg, right? A fertilized egg is a cell, right? But all of us here are not a single cell, right? We're trillions of cells, three to four trillion of them, all packed in the right place. We call going from that single cell to the four trillion cell entities we are now, we call that bodybuilding. And one of the biggest um, things about you know, biology is one of really amazing discoveries that have happened over the years, recently, the last three decades, is understanding the DNA toolkit that builds bodies from egg <coughs> to adults. It's a remarkable thing. And so I'm going to close with this because it's truly amazing. That is, if you look at our bodies, our bodies have a basic architecture to them. I'm just showing you to you in the vertebrae here. I've color coded them from the vertebrae and the neck all the way down to the lumbar and sacral and so forth. But you can see, there's a, and our limbs always stick out from the same place. Our ribs are always in the right place and so forth. Turns out there's DNA in the embryo that's turned on and off to make that pattern, to sculpt that pattern in our bodies. It's a remarkable. Guess what? Versions of the same DNA are seen in the embryo of flies. And what are they doing? They're building the basic architecture of flies. Same thing in fish, same thing in worms. So you can ask the question, and it's not unreasonable, is to ask, like, uh, OK, who cares? <laughs> who cares about your inner fish? I would say that the Nobel Prize Committee in medicine and physiology cares a lot, judging by who they've given the Nobel Prize to in the last four decades. If you look at the Nobel Prize to people who've made breakthroughs in basic biomedical research, 
that have awarded the Nobel Prize, who have they gone to? They've gone to people working on mice. They've gone to people working on flies. In fact, two Nobel Prizes awarded to five people in the last 15 years have gone to folks working on a tiny little worm the size of a comma on the piece of paper, Cinerebditis elegans. Yet understanding the basic biology of that little worm is telling us about how our genes are naturally turned on and off in health and disease, and how our, how our cells are programmed to die naturally, and what goes wrong in diseases like cancer. I like to think that as we discover cures to everything that ails us, from Alzheimer's to different cancers, that the breakthroughs that will extend and enrich our lives will in some way be based on, on understanding the biology of flies, worms, mice, and in some cases even fish. I can't imagine a more powerful or more beautiful statement on the importance of our connection to the rest of life on our planet than that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. I think now it's time for questions, but I just want to say we're, we've continued our polar research. Now we're working in Antarctica. I'm happy to talk about it later, but we uh, just returned two months ago from the other part of the world, working on a similar rocks, a little bit older, uh, right outside, uh, right about 600 miles from the South Pole. This is what it looks like. It's beautiful. <laughs> so I'd love to take questions. We have a roving mic here, one on each side. Um, I'm over here on the side. I had a question from one of my students when you spoke this morning. Um, actually, an environmental question because you spent a lot of time either up in northern Canada or down in Antarctica. And we were wondering if you were seeing any signs of climate change, uh, what kinds of things like with the polar ice yeah, or anything yeah, great like question. that. Yeah, so like, like here was New Year's Day this year, so I wasn't noticing any signs of climate change uh, <laughs> in my tent there. But yes, so it depends where. So like where we are in the Arctic, uh, the, the uh, ice is retreating very quickly. And indeed, it's, much, it's changed an enormous amount within the last five decades. So one of the things we do is we use aerial photographs that the US Navy and the US Air Force did like in 1958, 1959 in flyovers of that part of Canada. And you know, they mapped it. You have these huge plates of, of photographs. And so we can look to see where was the ice back then and where, is it is, where it's now. And it's retreated dramatically in many of the valleys. And indeed, um, the ice in Lancaster Sound is much more open than it was uh, decades ago. So yes. In Antarctica, it's a little bit different because it's a huge continent. And so some places, and the ice is retreating incredibly fast. And a few smaller places, it's increasing, like where we're working. But it, again, but on, av on balance, it's definitely, uh, it's, the, the ice is definitely shrinking. Um, but you know, it's variable. You know, it's a big place, so some places increase, some people, most places are decreasing, however. So we're definitely noticing it. Does it affect our work? Uh, yeah, it does. The way it affects our work most is the polar bears are coming more inland. They're losing their habitat on the ice, and so there are more polar bear encounters, um, which is obviously something that uh, we're, we're mindful of. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I can't really see, so you just have to. Anybody? Um, hi. Did you encounter any issues with uh, post-depositional deformation of the fossils? And if so, how big of a setback did that propose, or if any? Yeah. I mean, it's, the good news is, um, so if you look at this fossil here, in, in terms of like being like, like de deforming plastic deformation and so forth by the rock itself. So if you look at it, this thing's been pancaked a little bit. I mean, it, looks, it has a flatter head in preservation than it did in real life. It still would have been pretty flat, but it would have been puffed out a little bit more. Now, how do I know that? We've, we now have CT scanners, and we can blast inside it. We can see the little cracks, and we can reconstruct it more fully. So yeah, it's, it's been pancaked a bit, flattened, but not too much. You know, it's still like a flat head. But yeah, um, the good news is, is we have many specimens now of this critter, and other species as well. And so some of them are not preserved well. Others are pre preserved incredibly well. So we have a few that are real reference specimens for us to understand to put the whole thing together. The good news is we have whole articulated skeletons put together you know, by nature, <laughs> which is great. Uh, one question, sorry. Uh, regarding for the, how does the DNA and genes 
uh, is going to be related to the fossils with the time periods that millions of years ago? Yeah, so we have, so basically um, what we do is we're looking at genes that are deeply conserved, that are the same among fish and limbed animals alive today. And they're remarkable. That is, I can look at the genes that, in fact, teams of researchers have, have done this in, in England, Switzerland, Germany, and elsewhere, um, looking at the genes that build the hands and feet in mice and people in frogs and chickens. And we can look at those, we can ask, how are they working? And guess what? They're also present in all fish today, from sharks to uh, lungfish to coelacanths to, you know, pretty much they're already there. But they're doing other things. They're not making wrists, they're making parts of the fins. So we can compare the genes that are building the bodies of us, and we can see them in fish, and we can ask the question what they're doing. And what we're seeing is it's not always like new genes, it's the reusing old genes in new ways. So all vertebrates have these genes, so it's not unreasonable to assume that these fossils as well. So what we're seeing is in things like Tiktaalik, we're seeing a wrist for the first time forming in a, um, uh, in a fin, in, in, in something that has fin structures. And so what that did is it led us as molecular biologists, that part of my lab, to look for the signature of a wrist genetically in fish fins, and it's there. It turns out it's there in terms of DNA. You bet. Hi there. Um, just wondering what other transitional fossils that haven't been discovered yet, what kind of gaps in the history of life, either in what you study or just broader history of life, would you be most interested in finding? Well, so the, the old adage goes, um, when you find an intermediate fossil, you create two new gaps in the fossil record. <laughs> um, you know, so it's another, I mean, I can continue this transition for the rest of my life. But the one I'm really interested in now is the origin of fish themselves. How did that body plan come about from spineless and jawless ancestors? And there's a case where we don't have a ton of great fossils. And the reason is people really haven't focused on it all that much. I've always learned, go where they ain't, you know? So kind of a Yogi Berra approach to paleontology. So that's kind of what I do. And so we're, we've pushed our search back for part of what we're doing deeper in time, to ask how vertebrates themselves, how creatures with skulls and that sort of thing came about. We have some decent fossils from China and from elsewhere, but we could do a whole lot better. And there are others as well. There are other transitions. Almost any transition can use new fossils. Listening to your lecture, uh, the concept of, of funding uh, comes to mind in terms of uh, how much money do you have to raise and who are the funders? I assume you ah, don't just put out a uh, GoFundMe page. We got no. an idea. Uh, but there's a hat going around, so if there's <laughs> any... Um, um, yeah, that's a great question. So how do you do it? So typically, we would have about five or six funders for each expedition. We had um, private individuals and family foundations from Chicago and Seattle. We had, um, we had a, a National Science Foundation grant that covered a small part of it. We had a National um, uh, Geographic Society grant to cover part of it. We had funds from my university. We had funds from Ted's Museum. You know, just putting it together. So the total budget of a, so like one of these, well, Antarctic is very different, but um, for like an Arctic expedition uh, was about $130,000 just for the summer. Um, and most of that, um, virtually all of that is helicopter time. $3,600 an hour for a helicopter up there, dollar a second. So when it's running, I'm just seeing money fly out the window, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I'm like, turn the engine off, turn the engine off, you know. <laughs> um, but no, that's, that's a real thing. So when we're thinking about the planning and logistics, it's not only, you know, we have the money, we, now we know we have a set amount of funding in hand, um, but we're always figuring out what we can do with that funds and how we can optimize weight so we can maximize our use of that helicopter time. So that's why one of the reasons why we optimize on not taking many people, taking a small crew and that sort of thing, is so that we can go light on the financial footprint, honestly. To, to work there. Antarctica is very different because that's funded by the U.S. Um, Antarctic program, and they cover it some, from soup to nuts. And I'm glad because it's extremely expensive. So they, I didn't even know the budgets for that one, and I'm glad I didn't. Uh, hi. Um, I have a question about what kind of evolutionary or environmental factors prompted fish to start um, exploring the land. Yeah, so what are the factors that you know, got them out of the water? Well, would you, well, hold on, let's go back here. Let me find a different slide. Oh, uh, here it is. So why would creatures want to leave the water? Does this answer your question? So, um, 
<laughs> I mean, that's, I'm, I'm being funny, but that's actually part of the answer, right? So when you think about what was going on inside these rivers and streams in Devonian ecosystems way back when, what you had was pretty much every fish that you find, except for a few, were predators. It was a fish eat fish world. Yeah, there were small um, filter feeders, heavily armored, but most of the action were these predatory fish, and some of them are huge. Like the ones we find with Tiktaalik are 15 feet long. I mean, huge critters. So it's a fish eat fish world. So when you have something that intense, you know, there, there are several ways to evolve. You can get big, big fish eat little fish. You can get armor, or you can get out of the way, right? But the other thing is, is like, compare water to land at this time period. You already had plants on land. You already had invertebrates. You had arthropods on land, juicy, yummy arthropods. OK, so when you think about what the impetus would be, here you have predators and competitors. Here you have very few predators and competitors, but lots of food. You know, so any pressure that might get you into these marginal environments away from predation, away from um, competition, and into this new food-rich environment would probably be selected for. So it's kind of that contrast between water and land. Uh, I had a quick question regarding some of our modern species that we have in terms of fish. Uh, we look at different solutions that uh, fish species have developed to solve problems like locomotion in shallow water across land or even breathing in low oxygen yep. environments like the labyrinth fish, uh, lungfish, and things like that. Um, have you, in the years digging through these fossils, come across any evolutionary dead ends where you saw something start to emerge and it, it kind of made sense, but it just disappeared? Yeah, so there are, as your question points, as your comment and question point out, there are lots of fish that explore this interface between water and land, and we see them today. Like there's the mud skipper. The mud skipper is this wonderful little animal uh, that can live on mud flats for 24 hours, breathing through its skin or gulping air. Um, there's the climbing perch, there's lungfish, there's other critters that can, air breathing is not uncommon in fish. In fact, it's one of the more primitive characteristics in fish. We see fish that can walk around on the mud flats or even on the water bottom, very common, where they have a version of a wrist. The difference with these animals for, most, for the most part is they're doing it with different structures. So our branch of the tree of life did this with a humerus, a radius and ulna, and our type of lung. Whereas when you look at mud skippers or you look at these other fish, they're doing it in a slightly different, in a different way. So it's a different experiment. So we do see that. And indeed, when we look at this time period in the Devonian, there are other creatures that are exploring this space, um, you know, exploring the interface between water and land. And they definitely uh, appear to be uh, dead ends. This creature's called rhizodontids, for instance. Beautiful fins, but. They didn't cut it. Uh, do you have any information on like their reproductive system? Um, yeah, so the reproductive system. No, so you know, basically what we have are the bones. You know, and it was a lot of speculation for us even to do like these with colors and things like that. So no, we you know, judging by extant creatures, you know, we can make guesses that they had a larval stage likely of some form, you know, um, that there was probably some form of external fertilization. But that just, those are speculations based on living creatures. We really don't have the hard evidence for that, I'm afraid. How many bones does the Tiktaalik have? An enormous number. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds. So, I mean, that's a very good question because, you know, the thing is, we don't always find, so in this skull alone, there, there might, you know, there's almost 70 bones in this skull, right? They're all sort of, they're all sutured together. But, you know, we don't always find a skull that's like this. Sometimes we'll find it, and it's totally disarticulated, taken apart. So we might find these bones individuated. So that's just the limbs. So these things are probably about 300 bones, something like that. So it's a lot of bones in one animal. Hi. Um, so I have been, like, I'm personally very interested in the idea of, like, I don't know, like, how much you're invested in, like, space and things like that, but in the Galilean moons and, like, you know, the possibility of oceans, like, on, like, Europa and stuff, if, like, you were, if, you know, NASA were to, like, discover, like, um, you know, some type of water beings up there, forms of life, which is likely in my opinion um do you think that that would like impact like how you look at like evolution and stuff because i feel like that would give an insight more of an well insight yeah i mean i think that's a good question so i mean if we find evidence of life on another body a celestial body um and you think there are a lot of celestial bodies out there space is kind of big you know <laughs> and so um 
Yeah, and so what, what is that life likely to be? It's likely to be some form of microbial life. Um, you know, we might have a hard time defining what is life at that point, so that might affect, you know, what is a living thing in terms of a complexity, reproduction, um, stability, the physiology, and so forth. But yeah, but definitely, you know, if you think about multiple experiments for life, I mean, look at it this way. You know, the current estimate for the earliest origin of life on our planet is four billion years. The planet's 4.57 billion years old. That means almost as soon as the planet came out, pretty soon, there is life. So, you know, and then you look at it, then there were probably multiple starts at it, and then life took off. Um, but yeah, it's pretty remarkable. So if, if, my, if a sort of self-dividing, self-propagating system was able to come about uh, that quickly, on our planet, imagine what's possible on other bodies where the, the conditions are right. So yeah, so I've always argued that they should send a paleontologist or two on these different missions. You know, with a rock. <laughs> send Ashton Embry with his rock hammer and his can opener and it'll be totally fine. <laughs> but no, that's a good question. It would, it would definitely change, you know, when you think about it, just think about it. It's like they announced tomorrow life, you know, discovered on Mars in the rocks. and It would be a fossil, right? Um, you know, that would change our place in the universe. You know, are we alone? Are we special? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, we, every bit as dramatic as the Darwinian shift, you know, if not more. So with all of the guessing you have to do with fossils and you know, paleontology in general, how do you know when to stop looking or like how do you make those educated guesses about the rest of a fossil? Well, let's get educated guesses is the idea. So, you know, in this case, uh, we uh, didn't stop because we, as every year we came back with we, an incremental success. The rocks were too good. That's what we always felt. We'd return. We didn't find Tiktaalik. You know, I'd always come back and my, my wife would say, did you find your fish? I said, no, I didn't find the fish. She said, you going back? I said, yeah. She's like, oh, no, not back there. But the reason is, and, you know, she's the one who had to, like, I'm only here because she supported it all the way through, trust me. But, um, but, you know, every year we were making incremental success. When you don't make that incremental success, then you sort of have to give up. And I've had to give up on a number of expeditions over the years, where you go, you'll find some fossils maybe the first few weeks, but then you're not finding anything new. You know, at some point, are you finding anything new? Are you finding anything, uh, any rocks that are likely to hold new things? That's an art, not a science. And there have been cases where I gave up on a place and, you know, we decided, well, maybe I shouldn't give up on that. We went back four or five years and we were later and we were just, for whatever reason, successful. That's just as much art as science. Yeah. I have no easy answers to that. I've stuck with some expeditions longer than I should have. You know, that's, that's life. Okay, we have time for one final question over here in the side here. Given the uh, advent of uh, better CAT scanning and things like that, I was wondering if you've had a chance to examine the brain structure of something like Dictalic and Yes. Let me see if I have the movie here. So we, uh, we didn't do the brain structure because we haven't gotten there yet. But we did. Oh, I don't have the Tiktaalik movie. But um, we, I don't have it on this thing. Oh, I'm sorry I don't. We, um, we've done with CT scanning. Well, this will be a GAR. It's going to be good enough to show you. Let me see if I can get it. So we can use CT scanning to watch this, a GAR, an alligator GAR, which is, we use as a model for tectonic feeding. Look at this. So we can use CT scanning to show how it feeds and how the different bones work to pump and move food around. What we're able to do, it's kind of cool when you look at that, right? You can see how these different bones work to open and close the, and you look how the cranial kinesis, look to see how the bones expand as the animal eats. That's a living GAR. We're able to put them in the, um, in the aquarium and watch. But we can also dissect tectonic um, digitally and then put together each of its bones, like yay, and then we can look to see how those sutures of those bones interdigitate. And we discovered that Tiktaalik lightly had a lot of cranial kinesis too. So I don't know much about the brain, but what the CT scanning has done is really showing us how these bones, of the, these many bones of the skull, like we were asked earlier how many bones, there's lots of them, um, but how they work together as the animal feeds. And I, I'm sorry I don't have the movie of the reconstruction doing it, but it's, we use the GAR movie as, a, as an example to do that. So it really gives us insight into you know, parts of the skull we'd never see otherwise, you know, which in this case would be the, um, would be the sutures. Seeing something like endocast of the brain is a little harder because that part of the skull is a little more deformed, the ventral side, unfortunately. So we probably won't have that information. If it's okay, we have a final question over here with one sure. of our future paleontologists, perhaps. You bet. 
Um, did Tiktaalik go extinct? If so, how? Or did he just like evolve over time? Yeah, no, he, um, so Tiktaalik, she um, was, uh, or he, or whatever it is, and, um, is uh, it probably, hopefully both, because we would have gone extinct, definitely, uh, <laughs> if, <laughs> if it was just a he or she. Um, but, um, you know, it's definitely extinct. There are no more Tiktaalik on the planet. But one thing you know as a paleontologist is every species has a beginning, a middle and an end, every individual, right? And so every species goes extinct in some way. They either go extinct by all their individuals disappearing and leaving no descendants, or they go extinct and they have a rich descendant um, pool. Tiktaalik is likely of the latter, that it has lots of descendants, including you and me, or it's at least a cousin to us. Um, but uh, it's definitely extinct. You, you would not find one walking on the planet today. Um, it would be kind of a frightening thing if you did. <laughs> Well, Dr. Shubin, thank you very much for just a fascinating lecture. Can we get another round? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, if you're joining us for the dinner, please check in at the registration desk in the Science Center. And Dr. Shubin has agreed to spend a little time signing some books <clears throat> out in the lobby in a few minutes after he gets organized. So thank you again for coming, and we'll see you again next year. <laughs>